Hi everyone, welcome back to the final countdown. I'm Pastor Rick Long, if you don't know who I am. And I'm sharing about some of the last days um, and some of the, I should say, this, the signs of the last days that we are living in. You know, when I refer to the last days, I'm talking about the rapture, the seven year tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus. There's a lot more involved, but let me read something. Yesterday I, I finished talking about the rapture and the 16 proofs that it's a pre-tribulation rapture and that I am uh, a pre-tribulationist. But I want you to listen to this in 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, chapter 4, if you go and look at chapter 4, it describes the last days. So let me read this with that in mind. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and the night, so be on your guard, uh, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. And then listen close. So for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Why is this critical? Because you can't be encouraged if you're going to suffer through seven years of the tribulation. It will be a period of time that would not only result in your most likely your execution, Christian, but it is going to be hell on earth. And it's a judgment that was proclaimed on the nation of Israel and all of those who have rejected the gospel since the days of Daniel. Now, with that being said, we're challenged again to encourage one another with these words. And those words are that we won't be here for that judgment. That judgment is for others. Now, there's people who are Christians, good Christians, wonderful Christians, who are mid-tribulationalists. And there are those who are post-tribulationalists. I don't really have too much tolerance for a post-trib uh, person because there's nothing biblically that, that even hints to that. And you would have to believe that, that Christians are under God's judgment, and they're not. A mid-tribulationalist is one that I feel oftentimes is confused between the tribulation and the great tribulation. The tribulation describes all seven years. The Great Tribulation describes the last three and a half years, and that will be marked by something I'm going to describe to you today. It'll be marked by what is called by Jesus and Daniel, the abomination of desolation. So after the Antichrist walks into the Holy of Holies, the Jews will be sacrificing again. By the way, all of the plans to start sacrificing in a newly constructed temple are already in place and in motion, okay? So when the Antichrist does that, you will know then that there's only three and a half years of the tribulation left if you happen to become a believer who is reading through the Word of God at that time. Now, who is the Antichrist? I mean, really, who is this man of perdition? There are actually 30 titles in the Bible for the Antichrist. You can go and check all these out. Let me just give them to you real quick. Number one, the bloody and deceitful man, Psalm 5, verse 6. The wicked one, Psalm 10, 2 through 4. The man of earth, Psalm 10, 18. The mighty man, Psalm 52, 1. The enemy, Psalm 55, 3. The adversary, Psalm 74, 8 through 10. The head of many countries, Psalm 111, 6. The violent man, Psalm 140, verse 1. The Assyrian, Isaiah 10, 5 through 12. The king of Babylon, Isaiah 14, 2. The son of the morning, Isaiah 14, 12. The spoiler, 
Isaiah 16, 4 through 5, and Jeremiah 6, 26. The nail, Isaiah 22, 25. Number 14, the branch of the terrible ones, Isaiah 25, verse 5. The profane, wicked prince of Israel, Ezekiel 21, 25 through 27. The little horn, Daniel 7, 8. The prince that shall come, Daniel 9, 6. The vile person, Daniel eleven twenty one, The willful king, Daniel eleven thirty six, The idol, shepherd, Zechariah eleven sixteen 16 through 17. The man of sin, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. The son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. The lawless one, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. The antichrist, number 24, 1 John 2, 22. Number 25, the angel of the bottomless pit, Revelation 9, 11. Number 26, the beast, Revelation 11, 7 and 13, 1. Number 27, the one coming in his own name, John 5, 43. Number 28, the king of fierce countenance, Daniel 8, 23. Number 29, the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, 15. And the desolator, Daniel 9, verse 27. And we're going to unpack that chapter tomorrow. But of all these titles... They were meant to just give us a glimpse into his evil character and personality. He'll be, the Antichrist that is, the most wicked and possibly the worst human being who has ever lived. You take Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, and all those wicked people and wrap them into one and multiply them by a dozen and you won't come close to how wicked and awful this character or this lack of character a human being will be. He'll be possessed by the devil, literally. And what we know about the Antichrist is he will have complete control of this world and every person will be under his domination. Now, did you ever think before COVID that you could literally scare people, especially Americans and those living in freedom and in Europe and Canada and different places? Did you ever think there'd come a time when you could scare us into hiding in our houses, into believing everything the government puts out there, believing everything that came from the CDC, everything that came from the NIH, all these organizations that really are nothing but bureaucratic wings of the government. And yet we did. All of us did. It won't be hard when Christians are gone to get people to comply. Because if you look at it, the people that stood as a whole against so much of the overstep of the government were believers and freedom lovers. Now let's look a, look a little bit at the Antichrist. Where does he come from? I believe scripture teaches that he comes out of a European coalition. The Bible tells us that early in his career, which I believe is happening right now, he takes power over three nations and with those three nations, he gets power over the European coalition. This way, he gets power over the entire world. When we talk about the false prophet, you'll learn about his strategy. For the world, it is to provide a license to exist. It will be the mark of the beast. This will be set up by Revelation, uh, or uh, you know, by the prophecy in Revelation 13, 16 through 17. It says, and it, it will be how you're identified. We know today, with electronic mapping, your DNA is able to be tracked. Did you know that? Did you know that in China, because of DNA mapping and facial recognition, combining those together, you could be standing on a corner, this is true, and jaywalk across the street. And even if the cameras don't pick up your facial recognition, the infrared and the, the uh, science behind what they have on their streets, they're able to track your DNA. And then they mail you a ticket, but they don't mail that ticket so you'll pay it. They've already deducted that amount from your bank account without your permission, all because of your DNA. This is where we get the mark of the beast, and he gains control over all the world. Now, the amazing part is that he makes a covenant with Israel at the very beginning of the tribulation after Christians are taken out of the world and he promises to protect them from all the Arabic enemies. And this so-called peace treaty will exist for a while. 
Now, what happens is a little glimpse of what I think just happened. Israel gets passive. They go back home. They focus on themselves. They sort of disarm, like, hey, we're finally at peace with the Arabic nations. And in some ways, they have disarmed and kind of fallen asleep on their watch, so to speak, during this Hamas terrorist attack. I'm not judging them. America's been asleep for quite a while. So the Antichrist, during the tribulation, breaks the peace treaty by walking into the temple and violating the Holy of Holies. You see this when he sets up the peace treaty. He tells Israel they can continue their worship of God. Isn't that interesting? And they're not worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping God. They don't believe in Jesus, didn't believe he was the Messiah. That's why they're in this judgment. And they make their sacrifices in the temple annually. And then all of a sudden, this deity, if you will, who, this man who believes he's a God, possessed by Satan, walks into the Holy of Holies and says, I am God, worship me. And this is what Jesus called the abomination of desolation, quoting from Daniel. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, we see that his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish daily sacrifice. Then they'll set up the abomination that causes desolation. They, as in the unholy trinity, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. That's even hard to comprehend. When you think about the holiness of the temple, God requires us or required his people, the Jewish nation, to walk into the Holy of Holies and be purified before they did. I mean, purify their body, purify their soul. I mean, they had to be pure when they walked in. And when the priest, the Levitical priest, went into the Holy of Holies, if he had not purified himself, if he had secret sin or he wasn't clean, he'd die on the spot. That's why they tied a rope around the waist of the Levitical priest because if he died, they didn't want to go in there. They pulled him out. So the Antichrist goes into that place and the whole earth is demanded by him to worship him as God. So what kind of persecution does that Antichrist begin and incorporate? You know, I'm asked that question a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm doing this because I've been asked so many questions. Well, it's not just overt persecution. You know, we think of beheadings and all this wicked stuff that's happening right now in Israel from Hamas. But think of it this way. During the time of the tribulation, you won't be able to buy or sell without the identifying mark of the beast. You don't have food. You don't have a place to stay. Let me just pause here a moment. In California, 6,000 volunteers have taken this chip that they have inserted at the back of their hand. They actually made it available for the forehead. Isn't that ironic? And they are testing the ability to have all of your information under the skin so that you can walk in and scan your hand. I mean, I don't know who wants to scan their head, but maybe in some settings that would be simpler. All of this is a precursor to the mark of the beast. Now, you don't have food during this time. You don't have a place to stay, no shelter. Uh, you can't sell. Many people, if not millions, will die from starvation during the tribulation. tribulation. So the Antichrist embodies the most cruel form of persecution, which is slow death. There will also be many ways that people will die. Wars, famine, pestilences, uh, disease, um, lack of water. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that within the first year and a half, two years of the tribulation, one third of the world's population will die. By the halfway mark, over half of the world's population is dead. And by the end of the tribulation, the Bible tells us that if God did not intervene, all human life would die, all plant life, all animal life. Now, there's many ways that he will execute. But remember, the Antichrist has an unholy trinity, okay? It's kind of, think of it this way. Uh, Satan is basically a false Elohim, a false, our God. He's, he's counterfeiting him. 
And the Antichrist is basically a false Jesus. He's counterfeiting the Messiah. And people will think he's the Messiah. They'll worship him as a Messiah. And then the false prophet is a false counterfeit Holy Spirit. So this unholy trinity is empowered by Satan and their purpose is to do evil at the greatest level ever. People ask me, what is or who is the false prophet? Remember, the, his entire purpose is not really religious. That, that's one part of it. But he's going to be the czar of the world economy. That's why I believe the Antichrist is most likely on the scenes and is part of the economic forum. And he's an economic leader and a satanic religious leader that forces the mark of the beast and forces everyone to bow down to the Antichrist. He is the one who forces them to bow down. Now, the first thing that happens during the tribulation is the Antichrist is finally in control and he can do what he wants. So he marches against Israel. So he, this very country that he signed a peace treaty with, he's now marching against the same way that the Arabic countries that want Israel wiped off the map feel today, he will be in line with them. And what the dictator of Iran said not long ago is exactly what the Antichrist will live by. He wanted the Antichrist to wipe out. He wanted to wipe out all of Israel and the West, uh, all non-Muslims. Non and what we see in this period of time is that the Antichrist will march toward Israel and all of a sudden he will begin to start hearing things that are happening. There'll be uh, wars and, and armies coming toward him from the north and the south and even eastern armies coming across the Euphrates River. And he has to stop at that time and deal with it. But if you want to fast forward, and we'll talk about more tomorrow. Revelation 16, 16 says that there will be a battle in the Valley of Megiddo. This is the battle of Armageddon. That's why it's called Armageddon. And in Revelation 19, 19, Jesus Christ comes back and defeats the armies of the world. The Bible tells us that Christ comes back in Revelation 19, 14 and 15. And by the breath of his mouth, he destroys all of those armies and the Antichrist and all the people who have rejected the Messiah. I mean, literally with a whisper, be gone. And the enemies of the earth will be destroyed. And the Bible says, the birds of the air will eat the scraps of those people and clean up after all have been destroyed. You know, Jesus Christ came as a lamb led to the slaughter. Next, he comes as a king led to his kingdom. Jesus Christ comes and takes down the weaponry of the, of the Antichrist and his allies and the coalitions fall apart. Revelation 19, 20 and 21 says Jesus establishes his kingdom and the only people left are those who are believers in Jesus Christ. And he sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem and the millennium. By the way, that's two words, mil, which means a thousand, and inium, which means years. And now this is the great hope we really want and we really need. And I want you to know this, because when you know what's happening during the tribulation, you can see now how everything happening in society and geopolitical spectrum and in uh, the United Nations and the health organizations is all moving toward a one world government. Now, tomorrow, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to be prepared. But there will be a final judgment. And I want to leave you with this. There's, there's two judgments talked about for the last days. There'll be a great white throne judgment. And there will be no believers in that judgment. Get that straight. And then there'll be the judgment seat of Christ and there'll be no unbelievers. You know, I was asked the question, which judgment is for Christians? It's the judgment seat of Christ. I got to ask this question. Will you be there? Will you be standing at the judgment seat, the Bema seat, which means rewarding stand? You see, the judgment seat of Christ is a, place in heaven where he will award us as Christians with our rewards for living a life for him. And we'll lay those trophies at his feet because he's the reason we're there. But there's also a sobering judgment called the great white throne judgment. 
And those are unbelievers. And they'll be judged from the books of their life. There are many books mentioned in the Bible, but the most important of those books is the book of life. The others, some of the others aren't even named. But Revelation 20 verse 12 says, if their name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast into a lake of fire and suffer forever. Now, my friends, let me say this. If you don't know Jesus, you can come to know him right now. The reality is, if you don't, you're facing hell on earth for seven years and then eternal separation from God for eternity. People say, well, how can a loving God destroy people? How can he send them to hell? Because God is not only loving, he is holy. He cannot dwell with sin. It is impossible for God to be in the presence of sinners unless they're covered in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. So for you and me, it all comes down to this question. Will you? Will you believe this message? That God so loved the world. That's you and me and everyone. Everyone that's ever lived, everyone that will live. That he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus Christ. To die on the cross, to shed his blood, to wash our sins away. That whoever believes in him, not becomes something, not belongs to a church, not begins this or that, but believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, I want to challenge you to do that today. Put your trust in Jesus. Admit your sin. Trust in your Savior. And listen as we look forward to what is ahead. God bless you. Join me again tomorrow for the final countdown. I can't wait to see you.